everyone. I'm your host, Nicole Wood. Welcome to SciComm Monday. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, alligator research in the uh, southwest of the United States. But just to let everyone know, if you're uh, new to SciComm Monday, uh, we try to make this as engaging a format as possible. So please uh, feel free to uh, send in your questions and we'll try to get those all, all answered. If we don't get to all of your questions today, uh, please tweet us afterwards and we we'll, uh, would feel uh, great with uh, answering your questions uh, on Twitter um, later. So I'm going to introduce today's guest. Uh, she is Abby Lawson from uh, Clemson University and she does uh, research with uh, alligators. So without further ado, Hi, Abby. Thank you for uh, joining us here today on SciComm Monday. Hey, Nicole. Excited to be here. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your background when it comes to um, your academic research and your uh, academic background. So give us a little bit of run through of how you got to where you are now. Sure. Well, I grew up in Juneau, Alaska, so the extreme Pacific Northwest, and I was super lucky to see a lot of wildlife every day. So you know, eagles, bears, salmon, you name it. And so I've always had fondness for nature, but um, around the time I was graduating, I was ready to get out of Alaska. So I grew up in a small town. So I uh, moved to California, went to the University of California at Davis, and started as a Japanese major, oddly enough. Um, yeah, <laughs> so it turns out uh, studying Japanese in high school is a lot different than it is in college. So oddly, I found my calling um, in wildlife. I, I remember the first day I stepped into the department and saw you know, taxidermy squirrel on the wall and everyone wearing flannel, I felt right at home. Um, so yeah, I was hooked. And after graduation, I worked in waterfowl for a couple of years throughout the Western United States, so Montana and Alaska. And eventually that led to summer jobs studying common golden eye uh, wildlife biology, so which turned into a master's degree opportunity. And I went to the University of Nevada, Reno. And you know, when I first started, I was really focused on you know, waterfowl in particular. But I picked up a lot of um, population modeling skills and got really sucked into that. So when it, came, when it came time to pick a career path, I really wanted to stick with that. And lo and behold, there's this PhD opportunity to study alligator population dynamics to inform management in Clemson, where I'd never visited <laughs> and I'd never yeah, been to the southeast at all and never seen um, alligators in the wild. So yeah, I just decided to take a chance and come out here. And so, yeah, four years later, here I am. Awesome. So like you've just been slowly kind of making your way down and across the U.S. then. Yeah, I feel like I need to, you know, round out my, my corners and go somewhere in the Northeast next. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, go to Massachusetts or Maine. But I'm, yeah. of course, I'm... I'm <laughs> or was a born in New England, so I might be slightly prejudiced or biased towards, you know, that, you know, part of the country. Yes. So <laughs> get some yep. great lobster there. It's definitely worth going. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, So with your research, are you mostly just based around the Clemson area or are you throughout the uh, entire southeast uh, there with your research? My research is focused on the state of South Carolina, but the alligators inland distribution um, is ends about two hours from here. So if you picture South Carolina, it's shaped like a pie slice. So the crust end is at the ocean and Clemson is kind of at the at the inner point. So, um, yeah, we're about yeah, we're about two hours or so from where the distribution ends. Um, so that's where I'm based, but all my field work is on the coastal plain of South Carolina. So I don't conduct field work in other states, but I've you know met a bunch of alligator biologists from other states and compared notes, which has been a huge help. Again, being you know, the Alaskan trying to study alligators, in South Carolina. So, like, is a is there any special concerns with them in South Carolina? Like, or are they? Um 
you know, having like threatened status or is it you know, more unusual to see them up there? Because I, I think when most of us think of alligators in the U.S., we think of Florida. I mean, I don't know if it's just because, you know, the University of Florida is known as the gators. And so we always think of them being as Florida. And I remember when you sent me the map, you know, seeing how widespread, like I never thought of alligators being in Texas of all places. So is that just, is it the, are they currently spreading or are there like places where like, say maybe in your area where they might be threatened or endangered? Like, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the range and populations of the alligators? Yeah, you bet. And that's a really good question. Um, so South Carolina is towards the northern extent of their range and alligator life history. So things like growth rate and survival and reproduction, it's strongly influenced by temperature because they're ectothermic. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, they need, they need heat, <laughs> external heat to metabolize food and things like that. So because it's, we're farther to the north, there isn't, um, there's a shorter growing season, as they call it here, compared to somewhere like Florida. And what I mean by growing season is alligators can only metabolize food when it's above 66 degrees all 24 hours. So that only happens about six months out of the year up here versus you know vir virtually all year round in Florida. So in general, they have they grow a little bit slower up here, and obviously it's even longer for places like North Carolina. Um, however, there's a lot of uncertainties given climate change projections, how that could play out. Um, there's been some stories in the last couple of years about increased sightings around Atlanta, which would be considered a range expansion. And yeah, then comes into question too, if they are expanding to the north or perhaps inland, where are they gonna go? <laughs> Did it, I mean, so is, you know, is the range like, you know, because I saw in that one in the range map you sent me um, here, let me throw it back up here for uh, everyone. There was like that one spot, was it the the Wheeler uh, National Wildlife Refuge? So there one uh, random spot like up in the middle, like off the main uh, range. Like, is, is that something that is common occurrence with alligators that people have been seeing that they are just establishing these new populations that are completely separate from their overall population range? Um, I really don't know as much about that particular population, but what I'm guessing is it was a remnant population, so it was there, and then maybe you know the urban area filled in. Because not only do we have a changing climate, just over the last you know, yeah, a couple hundred years, there's been expansion, you know, of human sprawl and and fragmentation and things like that that's been changing too. And also to circle back on your other question, um, there's been harvest programs established in states uh, practically throughout their range. I think that North Carolina doesn't have a season, but they're gathering data to you know, evaluate the question better. In South Carolina, they established a public hunting season in 2008. So my research is largely focused on gathering information to, um, to make decisions on harvest as well as um, other you know, conservation decisions too, just to you know, figuring out carrying capacity and population dynamics and what's driving and things like that. So you're looking at the responses to the populations to that uh, harvest that's being initiated then? Yeah, I, that's our hope. And just figuring out what you know, types of habitat can potentially hold more or less alligators and what drives variation over time. Uh, great. Well, I'm going to make sure I get this question in before I uh, completely <laughs> forget, but my nephew, who's a big fan of all the... Uh, fellow sci-commers out there uh, was wondering whether or not you tranquilize the alligators because I was talking to him about how you put uh, transmitters on there. So can you tell us a little bit about the process of um, how you go through capturing the alligators and what information you're gaining from them and then uh, what you're uh, doing to them like as far as tagging them and putting uh, transmitters on them for your research? Sure. Well, that is a great question. Um, we capture alligators either through passive methods, so um, traps that we set up along alligator movement paths. So with those, we set them up, you know, and then check them periodically. And um, that's really the most efficient way is to set out a bunch of traps, check them, 
Alternatively, we can um, do active captures, which is trying to target individuals we see in the water with a fishing pole and a hook, and reeling them in. So the picture that's up there right now is called is a baited uh, trip snare. So I'm attaching some rope in which we'll put a piece of meat or a fish or something like that. And once the alligator grabs it, the um, snare, which is the wire that you can barely see, yeah, towards the edge of the wood, that tightens um, around their neck. And, and then there's a lot of slack on the rope. So yeah, this is like the moment an alligator is caught. <laughs> so literally, it's in a trap. <laughs> Um, so yeah, then, so there's a, there's a long rope that has slack so they can just hang out in the water until we come back to a trap. Um, so yeah, that's a baited trip snare. Um, we have other, we have another type of trap called a walkthrough, which again, it's just like it sounds. Um, there's a trap set up on alligator trail and alligator walks through, you know, sticks its head through the snare and then we come back um, and get it later. So yeah, so once we have the alligator, um, secured, so we typically, First thing we do is secure its jaws <laughs> for obvious reasons. So we you know, put multiple snares around the mouth and then secure some duct tape. We also put a towel over the alligator's eyes, typically a wet one, but so that it puts pressure on their eyes, which helps calm them. And then we usually have somebody hop on the back um, and somebody else hold the tail. So the alligator's tail is incredibly muscular and it could easily knock somebody out if we were to hit them in the head. So um, yeah, my guess is there's probably somebody outside the frame in this picture <laughs> holding the tail. <laughs> That's a 12-footer. I remember that day. So, uh, uh, you said it's a 12-footer. We had a question come in. Uh, what's the, the typical size of the uh, gators that you'll catch in your traps? So is a 12-footer about normal size, or what's the range that you'll get in those traps? So females tend to stop growing you know, between 8 and 9 feet. So a female above above nine feet is pretty big um, versus males. They can get up to 14 feet. The maximum length that we've ever come across um, on our study, our males are probably close to 13 feet. Um, but the overall record, so the longest credible alligator measurement um, is, is 14 feet, 9.5 inches, I believe. And that was harvested in Alabama in 2014. Oh. Is it, you know, um, are there a lot of, like, just rumored sizes out there of where you have people photoshopping and trying to make the gators look as big as possible to, like, have these, you know, mammoth gators, uh, such as, like, I remember there was the movie a while back, uh, Lake Placid, where it deals with uh, crocodiles, but it's still, like, you know, was this huge, gigantic, you know, really <laughs> probably not possible um, size. It, I mean, in theory are those possible or are you just thinking that it's just people are just being you know using photoshop or other methods to try to make their gators look bigger and better for their facebook pages well yes and yes <laughs> <laughs> i mean well i mean i don't i don't think there were i think that it's very likely that there probably used to be larger alligators out there um yeah, you know, there's a big debate in the alligator crocodilian community whether growth is determinant um, or indeterminate. So do they keep growing throughout their lifetime or do they stop? Um, a recent paper from our study showed that they do level off and stop growing. So males typically stop growing in their early 40s and females in their early 30s. Um, but that said, I, you know, I think that they maybe did used to grow bigger, but the the largest individuals were often targeted, you know, for hunting or poaching or things like that. And we aren't totally sure what controls growth. It could be genetic, you know, we know that some of it's environmental, you know, it could be early life conditions, things like that. Um, but all that said, I've definitely come across, you know, a lot of misinformation on social media. I saw a picture of a saltwater crocodile. They were claiming it was 30 feet, but I think the world record is around 19 or 20. So you see a lot of, you know, forced perspective or manipulated photos of crocodilians. It seems to be a theme. Um, another mix is that there's different ways to measure them. So I can, I could demonstrate that with my little alligator model. <laughs> so, you know, one way that you could claim that alligator is actually bigger than it is, is if you lie a tape and have it follow the contours of the body. 
which is a little bit odd because, I mean, if we get a big belly or butt or something, it doesn't make us taller, right? So why, you know, would alligator with the large back hump um, make, you know, be considered longer? So, or you could measure it, you know, just, just with a taut measuring tape. Um, yeah, so... So there's different ways to measure it. We're not really sure what controls growth. And then it's also hard to know what was out there, uh, you know, a long time ago before, yeah, before they were thoroughly documented. So um, you said something real quick about, you know, they stop growing when they're 30 or 40 years old. How old do alligators live to? So on... On my study, I work with the with the population that we've been capturing and recapturing since the 1970s, and so given we've we've encountered some a female that was um, fully grown in the 1980s, and we know that because we've captured her as recently as last year, and she hasn't grown at all. So given if she was um, if she was captured as a 30 year old in 1980 you know, at least 30 years old in 1980, then she could be, you know, in her, in her sixties now. So, um, so yeah, I, I've, I've heard some, some speculate that they could live into their eighties potentially as well. So yeah, it's just, it's very difficult to figure that out because we know that they are long lived. Right. So it's unless like you're able to have an alligator that you tagged right, you know, after a hatch and be able to monitor it through its whole life, which of course, that's kind of hard to do when, yeah. you know, if they live longer than possibly you as a scientist might live to be able to see how long that they live. So you'd have to depend on someone else having tagged them before you came around. Um, yeah, exactly. And plus, given, you know, current scientific funding levels, you know, just having having that type of longevity in studies is really rare these right. days. It's getting harder, unfortunately. Even though it, it's so important, I, I know how much my research would have benefited from even long-term studies, you know, something that was even at least 10 years old would have helped, but I can only imagine, you know, when you're dealing with such a long-lived species to be able to have a study that lasts for a century or more would really be helpful to be able to see those um, actual true, you know, measurements of how long they live rather than just having to speculate based off of, okay, it stopped growing at this point in time. And so when you're um, marking uh, these alligators, how do you go about marking them so that way you can identify them later? Good question. We use multiple methods. Um, the most common one that a lot of other alligator marking studies use is called scoot notching. So the ridges that you see on the backs of alligators and on their tails, those are called scoots. So you know, like the little triangles that stick up. So what we do is we, we cut those down in a unique, um, individually identifiable pattern. So, um, and that results in an in a alphanumeric code. So yeah, in this, so in this diagram, the scoots on the tail correspond to letters. And so, so there's one row of scoots. And so here we have the C, the C and I scoots are cut down. Where it splits into two, those are called the lateral scoots, and the scoots on the left are the tens, and then the ones on the right are ones. So in that last picture, I believe it was something like 43. Um, and yeah, and then for the letters, so it starts at A, um, I guess, and in the anterior, and then works its way up the alphabet towards the end of the tail. And then we also use other um, identifiers. We use toe tags that go in their feet. And these don't have the longest retention time, but it's really helpful um, for, for populations that could be harvested because it's something that a hunter knows how to interpret. So, yeah, they, they can read it. Like most hunters probably don't know the lettering and scoot numbering system that we just showed. So, but, you know, most of them can read that. And so we've tried to get the word out about, you know, who to report, um, you know, harvested alligators to. And then the last thing we do is we um, insert pit tags into their neck and scan those as well. And all this seems, you know, very straightforward, but it is surprisingly hard <laughs> sometimes to figure out which alligator is which. Again, that's just a fun artifact of long-term studies. 
Do you think that the um, the toe tags, like I've got two questions with that. Um, one, why don't they stay in there so long? And then uh, two, do you think that it's just because the toe tags are so similar to what, uh, say like the bands that you have on birds that people can identify so that makes it easier for them to understand what they are and maybe report those back? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how old the individual is when you mark it. So if their foot is still growing, that, you know, the toe tag could get pushed out. On top of that, we know that some of our alligators have ventured into marine habitats, which can really corrode um, the toe tags. So that's a problem too. You know, and alligators like to hang out in a lot of really gnarly habitats where the stuff can easily get snagged or ripped out. So, um, so yeah, there's no like national, you know, alligator banding <laughs> uh, database called yet. But yeah, I think so. I think you know the use of the toe tags, it really operates on a local scale, just getting the word out, you know, to, um, to post flyers, like where people actually hunt alligators or at some of the meat processors. Cause most people, when they harvest an alligator, they don't try to butcher it themselves cause it's a huge job. And so they take it somewhere else. And so just having, having something up there that they can refer to. Okay. Um, there was a question that came in earlier that kind of, uh, goes off of uh, what you said. Is the hunting season the same time as the breeding season? Like, how do, when do those occur? So the public waters hunting season starts in mid-September. Um, we do population surveys, so-called nightlight surveys, that go from May until mid-September. We try to wrap it up before hunting season because we don't want to be on the water <laughs> at the same time people are trying to kill alligators. Um, I can understand that. I always tried to be off yes. the water doing my mute swan research right before the waterfowl hunting season would begin up here in Michigan. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, plus to it, like you know, that causes problems for population estimation anyway. But yeah, so this is one of the boats that we use. This is the DNR boat, which is pretty sweet. Um, and yeah, so this is you know what it could look like on a typical nightlight survey. I believe that this is from Florida. So alligator eye shine is actually pretty easy to distinguish. Um, it glows this kind of cool yellow, orange, red color. And, um, and we can actually, if we get close enough, we can actually assign the alligator to a size class just by looking at its head. So the distance from the eye shine and to the snout tip, so the little bump at the end of their snout in inches correlates to body total length and feet. So the joke I always like to make is that alligators come in the English system, not in the metric. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the, I, the other thing I know you do is you put transmitters um, on the alligators for, I'm, uh, for keeping track of where their movements are. So can you kind of uh, walk us just uh, quickly through the uh, process of attaching the uh, transmitters and then what information you're getting off of them and is this uh because uh, i remember uh, asking earlier if you have to tranquilize the alligators when you do this so like how do you um help control because you were saying like you had to uh tape their mouths and you put the um cloths over their eyes is there anything else you have to do to try to um restrain them if you're not tranquilizing them yeah, so, okay, so correct. We don't use chemical uh, tranquilizers or anything like that. There's always a risk when you do that. So it's actually pretty convenient that in alligators, you don't have to do this. What we also do is we tie their uh, back legs behind their back. So essentially, if the alligator knows that it can't move, it doesn't struggle quite so much, which is nice. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we usually have somebody that is making sure the tail <laughs> doesn't whip around and knock our equipment all over the marsh. Um, so with the transmitters, we install the transmitter on the back of their neck, and we insert wires under the bony plates, uh, which are known as osteoderms. So there are these bony plates embedded in the skin. We put the wires underneath them so they're protected. And then the wires make a crisscross pattern over the top of the transmitter. And then we cover that in some marine grade epoxy so to, uh, to reduce damage to the wires. So, and then we spray paint it all black to make it look a little bit camouflage. And then sometimes they go in the mud and add some <laughs> natural camouflage like that. 
Um, yeah, like a, a study in Australia, they use this method show that they could stay on for four years. And when they do fall off, it usually doesn't cause too much damage. Or, well, it, it causes very minimal damage compared to some of the other methods that they used to do. Um, yeah, so this is the least invasive. And we can get, um, depending on the battery life of the transmitter, we're hoping to get between a year and a half to two and a half years of data from them. They're programmed to take location fixes every hour, and they have an accuracy of about three to ten meters. Oh wow! So oh, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah. What's the farthest that you've seen one of your alligators go from where you've captured it? Uh, probably about twelve miles. Um, it came back though. <laughs> so that's we've seen all sorts of really interesting behaviors. I mean, we had one that like swam around in this. 10 mile triangle <laughs> all summer. So it just it had a couple of freshwater ponds that like to hang out and then would swim around otherwise. Other ones just sat around like big lumps <laughs> in their pond. So um, yeah, we're trying to get at you know, some of the factors that could influence these behaviors. Like do bigger ones move more or less? You know, are they maybe defending a territory? Um, and then, you know, use of, mer of, you know, marine or brackish habitats, like, is that linked to certain environmental patterns? You know, like, are they more likely to use salt water if there's been a lot of rain so they could better withstand the salinity? Okay. Yeah, it would be interesting to see, like, you know, what their true ranges are and how their ranges depend on what their particular environments are. Mm hmm Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny to see they're all very different, so it's hard to make a generalization other than that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so what's the, I don't know, maybe like the, because we only have a, a few minutes left here. Let me double check here on our, uh, our time. Um, yeah, just a couple moments left. So what's like maybe the, the coolest field story you have from getting to work with alligators? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's hard. Hmm. Try to think of one that's not like overtly dangerous or something that happens. <laughs> um, I will say this is this is kind of funny and every everything turned out okay. We were doing a nightlight survey. Or we were getting ready to. We drove it during the day. So this is an impounded wetland um, where yeah, you know, there's dirt roads in between you know wetland areas. And one of the things about alligators that makes them a bit of a menace to managers is. Um, is that they tend to cross the road in the same parts. And so if it's a dirt road or something like that, it really bores down into it and kind of, and eventually what happens is that, you know, the road gets thinner and thinner and thinner. So earlier that day we were practicing the route, we found this spot that was really bad. And we're like, oh my gosh, there's no way the truck <laughs> could go through there. And, you know, we're like, oh, we'll have to really make sure that we don't go here, you know, ever. So then of course, later that night, everything looks very different at night when it's hard to see and yes yeah, so we're driving all of a sudden it felt like the road disappeared underneath the truck it's like this sunk and we could see the like water you know rushing at the windshield and i'm oh, so happy wow. yeah like luckily we stopped you know <laughs> yeah so you yeah, know everybody's okay wear your seatbelt. <laughs> but it was, i mean looking back because everything was all right um you know, it's it was it's kind of funny to wind up getting burned by your study species. You know, it was an alligator trail. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, and we did. You know, in our yeah, we did take a wrong turn because we were trying to avoid that area. But yeah, so yeah, the safety classic wrong safety. turn at Albuquerque. <laughs> yeah, so it could have been a lot worse. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, they were setting a trap just for you after all those traps you set for the alligators. <laughs> They're like, yeah. get those researchers. <laughs> yeah. You know, the other thing that's kind of cool that I think is just really interesting to think about is the first transmitter that we installed in 2015, we used a different type of wire that we didn't use again because it wound up, the transmitter wound up falling off after a couple days. So that was a huge, expensive mistake. <laughs> oh. Yeah, then in 2016, we were installing a couple more transmitters. We captured this alligator, and, you know, it looked it looked totally normal to us. You know, again, it speaks so um, it speaks to the method not having, you know, much lasting effect. And then later, you know, we attached the new transmitter and looked it up, and sure enough, it was the first alligator 
that we had captured in the previous year. So, yes. So, so far, the second transmitter is, you know, working like a dream. <laughs> but, yeah. So, that, that alligator turned out being pretty expensive. But, yeah, just what are the odds of, like, happening, happening to get, like, the same alligator a couple years later, especially in a pretty big population like that? Right. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, you know, those scientists were pretty cool. I, I guess I could be part of their study. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Glad to have them back. Well, um, I think we're over time here. So if anybody else out there, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to tweet us after the show. I would definitely want to say big thank you to Abby for being on here with us. It was a great pleasure to have you on. And maybe uh, when your field seasons uh, kick back up, maybe we can talk about uh, having you back on and we could actually show everyone uh, your work live from the field. Yeah, that would be a blast. And thank you so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. Great. Um, so if you want to get a hold of Abby, uh, feel free to uh, tweet her at Abs Lawson on Twitter. If you want to get a hold of me, you can either tweet me at SciComm Monday or at my personal uh, Twitter handle of wildlifebiogal.com. A reminder that next week we're going to be uh, broadcasting uh, live from the Ecuadorian jungle. So we're going to have some fun with some uh, re real remote uh uh, periscoping with uh, Nancy Mirarelli. Uh, she does Cybug. So if you are on Twitter and have seen the hashtag uh, Facebug, uh, this is the person uh, behind all of that. So you're going to get to see some uh, really cool insects from the middle of the jungle. And with that, we're going to uh, sign off. I hope you all had a great time on uh, SciComm Monday. And uh, just uh, please have a great rest of your day. Uh, go out, explore, do some science, have some fun, and hopefully we will see you next Monday.